Great. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, um, hopefully we're all kind of trickling back in, you know, right after lunch session. So um, first, a little background about me. My name is Dr. Cardew. I am an assistant professor at All Children's right here around the corner, John Hopkins All Children's and University of South Florida. I'm also board certified pediatric gastroenterology and obesity medicine specialist as well. And I'm passionate about talking about fatty liver because it's really the first sign of changes that you see in your patients. And it really has to do with the obesity epidemic. So a couple of disclosures. Number one, I am part of the Pediatric Obesity Committee. And through the Obesity Medical Association, it's a multidisciplinary association of surgeons and clinicians and you know, nurse practitioners of all different uh, walks of medicine. And I've gotten permission to use the slides. I'm also part of the NASBEGIN, which is the North American Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition, foundation of NAFLD speakers. I am a contracted speaker through Abbott as well, but I will not be um, discussing any of their products, and I've not received any compensation from the societies I've mentioned above. So our goal today is to discuss fatty liver, the definition, screening guidelines, and diagnosis, and to discuss the treatment of fatty liver in children versus adults, as there are, there are key differences. I want to really mention that fatty liver, and the type of fatty liver I'm talking about is the fatty liver that's associated as a comorbidity of obesity. Know that fatty liver happens in other conditions and other disease conditions. And so we're not talking about the fatty liver that's caused by hepatic steatosis from alcohol consumption, from steroids, or due to chronic liver disease. And know that fatty liver is a histologic, mostly a histologic diagnosis. It is part of a group, you know, part of the metabolic syndrome, so which includes hypertension, dyslipidemia, increased waist circumference, and insulin resistance. Here, for your reference, I have listed the adult treatment panel three definition for metabolic syndrome. So which includes you know, increased waist circumference, you know, changes in lipid panel, systolic blood pressure, and plasma glucose changes. To understand it, I think you know, to go into the pathomechanism, you'll understand why this is happening and why there are other comorbidities that are associated with fatty liver. First, we start with the adipocytes, and know that obesity and fatty liver, it is an abnormality in how much adipocytes that individual has. And it causes metabolic dysfunction. Adipocytes secrete these cytokines called adipokines. And about 80% of these adipokines are, are not really good for you. 20% are good for you. So let's go over some of these adipokines. One is leptin, we've heard about this, it goes to the brain and helps with satiety. And then there's adiponectin, which is thought to have a hepatoprotective role. And what it does is it increases fatty acid oxidation, decreases de novo lipogenesis, and helps with hepatic triglyceride formation. Now when you have a person who is developing fatty liver, the big, big problem here is the insulin resistance. So here we have diet, genetics, diabetes, obesity, etc. You have this metabolic abnormality. Of, you have um, insulin resistance. And so all these other regulatory functions are no longer working to your advantage. So leptin, there's a resistance at the hypothalamus, so the patient doesn't really get the satiety uh, signals. And then adiponectin is really used up. So the opposite happens. There's decreased fatty acid oxidation. There's decreased hepatic triglyceride formation. There's more, there's more de novo lipogenesis. And more fatty acids are floating, if you can think about floating around. That's perfectly fine. You know, you have fatty liver infiltration, but what happens is what makes it difficult is that then you have this oxidative stress from cytokines, from the microbiota. There are people are thinking that there's some, some 
you know, elements or something that's secreted by the microbiota that's absorbed by us that causes the stress, or whether there's increased white blood cells between the adipocytes that's secreting all these cytokines, whatever the, the mechanism of the oxidative stress causes the progression to NASH. So, and I'll define that in a second. So necrosis and fibrosis then is created because of the stress. So really, with fatty liver, it's a spectrum. You start out with NAFL, go to NASH, or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis that has fibrosis and necrosis, and then eventually cirrhosis. And the key thing I keep bringing up is these are histologic diagnoses. What I mean by that is we have to look under a microscope to see if these cells are affected. So NAFL is defined as macro and microvesicular steatosis in more than 5% of hepatocytes. And NASH is the same thing but with uh, inflammation and fibrosis. There are two types. One is perisinusoidal fibrosis and the other one is portal and periportal fibrosis. Type one, seen mostly in adults, Type 2, seen mostly in children. Research studies are looking at this. We don't know why there is a difference between kids and adults, but their fibrosis pattern is definitely different, and I think there needs to be more research to understand you know, what the side effects of this is and what the implications are. There are some clinical features that are associated with more severe pediatric NASH, and also you would say adult NASH. So increased waist circumference, anything that involves diabetes and insulin resistance. There is a race predominance. So for example, there's more um, findings of fatty liver, NAFLD, NASH in Hispanic populations, even at a much lighter weight. Uh, versus Hispanic, I mean, versus white and uh, African American. And there's several genes, but one that's been described in the literature is the PNPLA3 gene. And when I talk to my patients, I say to them, you know, one, one day these genes were great. They're great when there was a famine or you didn't have enough food or, you know, there was disease. But now in our society where food's everywhere. I mean, you could go up to three in the morning and get a taco or something, right? Or a soda or whatever it may be. And, you know, the fact that we have a more sedentary lifestyle. Individuals who have these genes, it really is not very beneficial. And of course, advanced age, elevated liver enzymes, and dyslipidemia are, are other comorbid factors. So I want to take some time to talk to you about all these other conditions associated with NAFL. And so we, you know, I kind of pointed to this insulin resistance that starts this cascade of bad things happening, if you can put it that way. So with, with our diet, genetics, and neurohormones, and activity level, you have this metabolic dysfunction. And we went over this part of the pathway in a very simplistic form when I talked about the adipokines and the fatty liver. In kids as well, there is you know, uh, more bone um, growth and height growth, and they go through puberty faster. There's implications in renal disease. And obesity and fatty liver, they're linked. And it's going to affect every single organ system, the brain, the eyes, the lungs. Every single physician is going to have a patient with obesity and its side effects. But what I want you to focus on here is this pathway leading to atherosclerosis. And you, we, we're starting to see this in, our, in the patients, in these children where they're coming in, they have, they have elevated liver enzymes, but they also have elevated triglycerides and maybe even elevated LDL. And this pathway is linked. So when you have all these free fatty acids floating in the blood, they're mopped up by a lipoprotein, VLDL, and these VLDL molecules get very big. Just imagine this big pillow full of, of fat. They, they're saturated. There's nowhere else to go. So what happens is two things, HDL and LDL. So HDL transports these fats, and then they're renally cleared. So that's why your HDL is low, because it's being used up all the time. 
Your LDL, it preferentially likes cholesterol. It hates fat. It does not want to carry fat. But when it does, I say LDL is a team player, when it does, there is increased density and number, and then when they give up the fats, they have small particles. This is the recipe for atherosclerosis. These small particles can then go in the vessels and infiltrate. And the other thing that I want you to really hone in on is the increased risk of all types of cancers. I tell my patients, and we had a talk, several talks yesterday about cancer, but obesity is a state of inflammation, irrespective of the metabolic changes. It puts that patient at risk for cancers, all types of cancers. And so with that, you know, we talked about the cardiac side effects and atherosclerosis. What's concerning, and this is why I'm going to take a moment for us to really hone in on this, is that we're starting to see atherosclerotic changes in children as young as eight years of age. And I remember in med school, one of my professors said, oh, you don't have to worry about atherosclerosis. It was a lecture. He said, like, you know, you don't see atherosclerosis until they're 25. It doesn't have, happen in children. But what we're finding is in their lab values, if they have elevated liver enzymes and dyslipidemia, they're already forming plaque. So what's the implication as adults? What's the outcome? You know, you have these 9-year-old, 10-year-olds already having metabolic syndrome. What's the outcome? And so, you know, there's an increased overall mortality, but the most common cause of death is cardiovascular disease. Cancer is one of the top three causes of death as well. And then last but not least, NASH is the second most common cause of liver transplant. Number one is hepatitis C, but we all know that over time that's probably going to get eradicated with our amazing hep C medications that have over 90% sustained viral response. So obesity and fatty liver is going to probably take over. So how do we diagnose these patients? So there's two societies that I'm going to quote from. One is NASPGIN, which I mentioned, and the other one is the AASLD, which is the American Study of Advanced Liver Diseases. It's the hepatology group. And so these are screening guidelines. They're experts that got together, reviewed the literature, and made guidances. And what they're mentioning is screening should be considered between 9 and 11 years of age if a child has an elevated BMI greater than 95th percentile or between 85th and 94th with additional risk factors. What about the ASLD? What about for adults? Mm, there aren't any specific guidelines. And if anything, they're saying that it's not advised, it might not be cost effective. So there's not, it's interesting that the pediatric group is actively screening, but the adult groups do not have that same requirement. So what should you, what should you screen with? What's the best test? So again, all, the experts from NASPGIN felt that ultrasound is not recommended. And I am at fault for ordering tons of ultrasounds because it's easy, right? It's easy to order an ultrasound to look at the liver. What they are recommending is ALT. Why is that? So they feel that ultrasounds, although non-invasive, have low sensitivity and specificity, and you cannot differentiate between NASH and NAFL because they're histologic diagnoses. What they are recommending for pediatric recommendations is ALT, specifically to be concerned if it's persistently elevated for greater than three months or if it's greater than 80, so if it's a higher level. But again, remember, an a the ALT has a poor correlation with histology. There are several patients where I've followed where their ALT is moderately high, but you know, maybe in the 80s, 90s, but if you, take a, if you actually get a liver biopsy, you see advanced fibrosis. So it doesn't always um, correlate with severity. And you can't always differentiate between NAFL and NASH either. However, at this time, the consensus was this is probably the most effective screening method. 
There are other modalities to check for fatty liver, and specifically to quantify fat. So there are new ultrasound techniques that are being developed. There's also magnetic resonance elastography. And with MR elastography, you can actually quantify how much fat there is. The problem is the cost and the availability in many institutions. But hopefully, we can overcome that barrier. Now, besides fat, the other thing is to look for the presence of fibrosis. And so there is a type of technology called transient elastography. And it's used a lot more in adults. There's very little information in the pediatric literature. I think we need more studies. And of course, you can use the MR technology to look for, for scar and fibrosis as well. When we look at the AASLD guidelines about transient elastography, it was approved by the FDA for both children and adults. So it's not that it's an experimental um, imaging modality. It, it does have FDA approval. Of course, there's also the MRE that I mentioned. And then in adults, you can use uh, what we call the, the NFS, or the NAFLD fibrosis score, or the fibrosis 4 index. And what this looks at is age and BMI and platelet counts and liver enzymes. So then you plug this in into a calculator, and you can determine if that patient may be more at risk for fibrosis. So what about liver biopsy? And essentially, you, you know, if you get several experts up here, they all have a different opinion. And even being part of the NASPIC and NAFLD um, group and speakers, you know, when we had that discussion in our group, we didn't have a consensus. The problem is, is that how often should you do a liver biopsy? Should you do it every year, every six months? What about the cost? What about the side effects? Is it really going to change your management? So because there isn't a great definition, um, it really comes down to two things. One, the severity of disease. So if there is a lot of comorbidities and you are suspecting NASH, and you're suspecting that you need to get a biopsy before treatment, that's one indication. Another indication is if there are other coexisting problems. Let's say, as a hepatologist, you check for autoimmune liver markers and they are positive. Then you should probably proceed with a liver biopsy to make sure that there's not a couple different diseases that are in, in play. And that's not only in, in adults, but also in, in children. It's to proceed when the diagnosis is unclear or before the treatment of NASH. Very safe to use in children. You know, liver biopsies are very safe in both adults um, and kids. In extreme obesity, though, as opposed to someone like me doing the liver biopsy, it might not be bad to involve interventional radiology. When fatty liver is suspected and detected and, and, and or the liver enzymes are elevated, we should look for other diseases. Remember, fatty liver, if you separate it irrespective of obesity, is a state of cr chronic liver disease and, metabol you know, and a disorder of metabolism in the liver. You can see it when you have excess fatty acids, disordered beta uh, oxidation, in certain infections, mitochondrial abnormalities, et cetera. So you have to look for other things. I've summarized this all for you as a reference point so that you know that what are the other diseases that we should consider. So yes, there are genetic and metabolic uh, conditions. There are certain infections like hep C. Certain medications, you know, TPN, you know, rapid um, protein energy weight loss, you know, alpha-1 antitrypsin, autoimmune hepatitis. So there's so many other conditions that would present as fatty liver. But what about treatment? So now treatment specifically for the treatment of fatty liver due to obesity. And the key thing is, there isn't, unfortunately, there isn't uh, a quick solution. There isn't a magic pill. The basis of all the treatment still is exercise, diet, and psychology. I mean, that comes to the basis of what would be the, the treatment. When the clinician 
treats obesity and promotes weight loss, this will inevitably treat the fatty liver because it's all related. Remember, this is a chronic relapsing disease and these patients need chronic follow-up for years. So, it's, so the notion that obesity is due to excess calories and lazy patients is not, is, is, is not correct. Obesity and fatty liver is a chronic disease just like Crohn's disease or celiac disease or asthma that needs close follow-up and doesn't have a cure. It has a long-term um, treatment plan. And so focusing on the comorbidities, you know, that's the other big concept. And then the medicines some are to, f to promote weight loss, and some of them are to help patients during um, the development of NASH and fibrosis. Well, how much weight loss is needed to see this improvement? About 3 to 5% will help improve steatosis. 7 to 10% will reverse fibrosis and features of NASH. So I've simplified, I've oversimplified the etiologies of, of obesity, but I also wanted to share this with you because this is, when I see a patient, this is how I approach them. And I, I ask questions in each one of these categories, starting with the mental health. So are, are, is that patient emotionally eating? Is, how's their sleep? Do they have sleep apnea? Is there a lot of stress? We talk about the finances, lifestyle, and exercise. Diet, food quality, what time are they eating? What time are they not eating? And of course, this has an effect on the microbiota. Some people feel that people with obesity have a disordered microbiota that messes with their uh, metabolism. And then genetics and epigenetics, what are the risk factors? So obesity is a multifactorial disease. You have to look at every single component, and, in, and every patient's not the same. One patient, it might be more environmental. Another one would be the type of medicines they're prescribed is causing medical obesity. Their genetics, you look at their family members. What about their mental health or their sleep? So you really have to look, you have to ask questions in every category to, to figure out the source of it. So what are the strategies to promote weight loss? Nutrition, physical activity, and behavioral therapy are always going to be your foundations for all the patients. But in patients with more comorbidities and with, pro with you know, problems that are ongoing, such as NASH and um, type 2 diabetes and heart disease, hypertension, you look at pharmacotherapy and bariatric surgery, and this is you know, medications for weight loss, bariatric surgery, even as young as 16 years of age um, has been considered. So first light approach is lifestyle modification. Knowing that, you know, and we say this a lot in the pediatric world, but I think it's, it's good for adults too. Avoiding um, sugar-sweetened beverages, um, living a well-balanced, healthy um, diet, uh, moderate exercise and limiting the screen time and sedentary time. Know that this should be a slow and steady weight loss or a slow and steady um, progression to healthy habits, I always say. Whenever there is rapid weight loss, you see all the other side effects. So for example, patients develop um, cholestasis and develop gallstones, or they have a lot of lean body uh, tissue loss. So this should be a very, very slow process. Should be family or you know, individual oriented and focusing on a healthy habit and not a number. One of the things that I worry about, so specifically with my adolescent patients, I don't want to create uh, an eating disorder. So I say to them, I don't care about your, your size, I don't care about your, your weight, although that's what I measure, you know, the BMI and the body composition, all those things. But I want them to really focus on the healthy habits and lifestyle choices. Our goal is to alter the body composition. If you really oversimplify it, this is 
you know, an adipocyte problem. It's a fat cell problem with that signaling and excess adipocytes. So the opposite would be to make your patient more muscular. And all your therapy is focusing on increasing lean body mass. Composition is important. And this is why I mentioned, you know, fad diets or rapid weight loss is not where we want to go because if you do that, you lose lean body mass. And we all know that because obesity is a chronic condition, there's, inevitably, there's going to be weight gain. And when the weight comes back, it's mostly fat mass. So then the metabolism gets even more disordered. So we, that's why you see now that there's a trend to more higher protein diets because it helps with thermogenesis and satiety and stabilization of, the, of, of glucose regulation and also preservation of lean body mass. Another goal is to really be aware of your patient's well, mental well-being. I tell them, you can't change your weight until you change your mind. Or you could say, you can't change your lifestyle until you change how you approach or how, uh, how you think about it. And then really, our role is to be these non-judgmental uh, cheerleaders. We want to empower our patients and have a more positive uh, environment for them. Relapse and weight gain is common. It's just part of the, um, of the game. If you're a physician that does this, if you're a physician that has to coach on healthy weight loss, you have to know that there's always going to be weight gain. And it happens when there is changes in lifestyle or stress or, or sleep patterns. So looking at that, and then when that patient has that, you don't punish them. You say, well, I'm glad you're back. We're going to get back on we're going to get back on, on track. So having those kind of positive discussions. So what's the treatment approach? Mostly in pediatrics, but this is, this is the same sort of ideas also in adults. Prevention plus. So if a patient's between the 85th and 95th percentile, so this is more for pediatrics, you talk about basic healthy behaviors. And then the next stage is once they've crossed to closer to 95th percentile, you have monthly visits that work on behavior changes and motivational interviewing. And I, and I will go over what motiva motivational interviewing is later in the talk. Then the next stage is you know, including medications, management, and meal replacements. And then finally, if there's a lot of comorbidities, we work on weight loss surgery and the next step. So the first, now we talked about the general aspects of treatment, and I'm going to go a little bit more focused on what are some of the things you can think about when you see that patient or if you want to do that sort of coaching. So starting with psychology. Know that stress is a fantastic recipe to gain weight. So when you have stress, there are areas of the brain that are being activated, and there is an increased rate of hunger and there's a de desire for hyperpalatable foods. This is a normal survival mechanism in all of our brains. This is something that is very normal. So discussion of stress, lifestyle, you know, you know, work, you know, what's the work schedule like? It's good to have those discussions because it's it's the basis and the foundation for that person to choose healthy lifestyle. And so there's a stress cycle. So here you have chronic stress. There's behavior changes that happen due to that. You know, there's higher hormones that cause uh, increased body fat. And then, of course, as you have more adipocytes, that changes your metabolism. And then it's just you know, a, a chronic cycle. There are some questions. You could do this. You could take this. You have permission to take this and put this as a um, questionnaire if you want in your clinics to see if emotion is the source of overeating. So this is another uh, possible reason why um, the patient's gaining weight. So you can kind of see all the different qu the questions you can ask. And if you don't feel comfortable to do this coaching, send them to a psychologist. Team up with a psychologist in your, um, in your area to help you with this. What is motivational interviewing? So motivational interviewing is a, it's used by psychologists and performance psychologists to induce change. And 
healthy weight coaching and, and treatment of fatty liver and treatment of the comorbidities of obesity is really 80% coaching and 20% medicine. So there's a nice study that came out in the pediatric um, group, so it was uh, journal PEDS, and this looked at ch uh, children ages two to eight with BMI greater than 85th percentile, and but less than 97th percentile, and what they did was they randomized them into three groups. The key thing, I'm gonna kind of show you the, the punchline. The punchline is that at a two-year follow-up, checking the child's BMI, group three was the best, had statistical significant reductions in the BMI. This included four uh, uh, MD or four provider sessions with motivational interviewing of the family, and then six sessions with a registered dietitian. And you, we see this, the more the patient is brought back, they're seen, some centers see them weekly, or if you're seen monthly, it keeps the accountability, but also helps with the coaching. So motivational interviewing is a tool to cause different stages of change. And these are the four main principles. And what it does, it, pa it pushes a patient from pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and then maintenance. And I ask, before I even, st you know, when I meet a patient the first time, and I meet their parents, and I meet the child, I ask them, out of a scale of one to 10, 10 being, doc, I am ready to make healthy uh, lifestyle changes, and one, I look at the teenager, or I look at the kids, and one, they dragged you here, which one are you? So if the patient is seven and above, I just give them all the information I can. I can tell them about all the resources. If they're under seven, so if they're one to, you know, to an, or under seven, I talk about the barriers. I say, well, I'm glad you're a two and you're not a zero, and they usually laugh a little bit. I say, but what would, make, what would, what would take to get you to a 10? Like, what's preventing you? And then there's usually silence, they're thinking, and they talk about whether they had failed diets or they tried to do this or they had financial issues. So it's important to know where your patients are starting from. And you can assess, if they're in pre-contemplation, contemplation, contemplation you're gonna waste your time if you tell them about diet and the YMCA down the street. You have to know where they are before you start the coaching. Sleep is a very important component to metabolic health. There's a nice researcher up at Hopkins that is, um, and this is his um, handout, but specifically showing how sleep deprivation affects all aspects of your body, from your heart to your lungs, but right here in the middle, it causes weight gain. More cravings for sweet, uh, salty and starchy foods, increased hunger because of grenolin. Grenolin is secreted from your stomach, and decrease um, you know, control for um, hormones that uh, control your appetite. And essentially, there's two other hormones that go up. One is cortisol, and the other one is uh, orexin, both of them making you very, very hungry. So really working with your sleep medicine colleagues, finding out who does sleep studies in your area, who, who's an expert, and working with them for um, the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea and sleep problems. Interesting, interesting enough, obstructive sleep apnea is associated with higher association with NASH and fibrosis. Remember that once you have fatty liver, you need oxidative stress to cause fibrosis and cirrhosis. Well, this is one form of oxidative stress is, you know, hypoxia. So this is more likely to be associated with, um, with more severe forms of fatty liver and NASH. In this slide, it really goes over diagnosis and evaluation, but here I want you to focus on treatment, just like our last lecture where we talked about healthy sleep hygiene and treatment, you know, starting to work on the sleep patterns with the sleep doctor, so whether it be um, melatonin <coughs> or um, you know, specific sleep hygiene or CPAP machine, et cetera, to try to help those individuals with sleep apnea. So what about diet and nutrition? Know that there are a lot of diets out there. 
paleo, specific carbohydrate, low fat, elimination, low carb, Atkins, South Beach, they all work. They all truly, I mean, if you are, have integrity, you, you, it, they all work. But remember, our discussion here today is about fatty liver. And so the two that improve fatty liver is the carbohydrate restricted diet and the low glycemic diet. And it makes sense because the issue here is with the insulin resistance and it also has to do a lot with the carbohydrate metabolism through the liver. And so these are the ones that work the best for this specific condition. So when you take a PubMed search and you look to see what are the diets for NAFLD, all the recent studies have a common message. Eat less carbs, watch your portion sizes, and eat foods and supplements that reduce inflammation. I've summarized three separate studies here on one slide, but really comparing the low carb, the Mediterranean, or the low glycemic diet, and the low fat diet. And what they found, if you look at this graph, as I mentioned, they all, you all lose weight in the beginning, but there's a rebound effect with the low fat because of the amount of carbohydrates that person's eating, it's more conducive to weight uh, regain. The Mediterranean is a little bit slower, but we kind of get to the same result, and then you have the low carb. Both the Mediterranean and low carb groups decrease ALT levels significantly. The Mediterranean diet improves MRI results of steatosis. The one that I prescribe the most is the Mediterranean diet because in children, it is not as um, restrictive. They still get a little bit of carbohydrates, and then they get the good fats. So whether it be from olive oil or from walnuts, what we also find is that when um, patients start a weight loss program, if they improperly eat the wrong amount of macro and micronutrients, they're more likely to get cholestasis. So you see your patients who are trying to lose weight, they actually come back and they have gallstones and cholecholelithiasis, and then they buy themselves an ERCP, an MRCP, a gallbladder removal. The thought is if you have a little bit of healthy fats in there, it'll help at least reduce the chances of that as well. So this is why this diet might be superior. Also, comparing low carb, and this is people who are eating 50, 100 to 50 grams of carbs a day, very little. Um, although they're, they're both very good, the low carb diet um, has been associated with higher levels of CRP and inflammation. So that's something you have to keep in mind that it does in increase your inflammation for low, uh, the low carb diet. So what about exercise? The big thing is it has to be created as fun. It has to be something that you'd love to do. And that's why I ask the patients. When, and, I, and I don't tell them what to do. We actually sit down and say, let's create, just kind of positive language, let's create what would you want to do um, for exercise. So having them choose and having them repeat it, it's very powerful when a person actually says what they're going to do as opposed to passively just sitting there and taking um, the information. And so intensive exercise is important. For children, the current guidelines, the AP guidelines, is 60 minutes of aerobic activity daily. In adults, it's about five days a week, kids seven days a week. And no amount of exercise can outrun a bad diet. The other thing is that know that exercise does improve hepatic steatosis, but with the, the AASLD, um, they don't really have much of research to kind of say how much or what's the best uh, recipe for it. They feel that 150 minutes a week is helpful for, for removal of um, of the steatosis, but also a decrease in the serum aminotransferases. And they, for adults, recommend five days a week of moderate exercise. A pediatric study looking at NAFLD, so these are children looking um, at adolescents age 15 to 19. Both groups had NAFLD, and they wanted to see what's the best exercise, just aerobics or aerobics plus resistance training. 
this the results make sense because remember our goal is to make our patients more muscular. So superior improvement was seen with aerobics exercise and resistance training. When we looked at them, and they didn't even work out every day of the week. It was three uh, times a week for 60 minutes, and they were either um, 60 minutes on the elliptical or half an hour on the elliptical and half an hour weight training. When you add weight training, the patients lose more weight, but they also, uh, from a metabolic standpoint and all their markers, have a much better um, outcome. What about medications? As I mentioned, there is no magic pill. There isn't an easy way out of it for fatty liver. There are currently no medications or supplements that specifically treat fatty liver. But in adults, specifically the treatment is for NASH, right? So now, so NAFL, there's not really much treatment, but in adults, there's some consideration for treatment for um, NASH. The, when we look at the guidance and the guidelines, metformin currently is not recommended for the treatment of NASH in adults. Now, if they have diabetes, if they have some other uh, problems, dyslipidemia, if it's indicated for another condition, that's perfectly fine. But if the treatment is specifically for fatty liver, it is not the recommendation uh, from, a, from the ASLD. What about vitamin E? It's very, very confusing. So it's not recommended generally for, for patients with NAFL or patients with diabetes who have NASH, et cetera, but you may consider it for a non-diabetic, biopsy-proven patient with NASH um, to take 800 units a day. It does show improvement of liver histology, but, big but, there is an increased risk of bleeding and an increased risk of prostate cancer. So with that being said, risk and benefits, it's not as well recommended at this time. Well, the pediatric societies started to look at, you know, because the adults were looking at metformin and vitamin E, the pediatric groups were looking to see, could this be a treatment for uh, fatty liver? And essentially, the punchline of the tonic trial looking at multiple markers, ALT, ASD, and then um, histologic changes. You can see here, both of these kind of represent the same thing, whether it be through a table or through a graphical form, that really there wasn't much improvement, maybe a little bit of improvement in the ballooning degeneration. <coughs> so essentially, when the experts sat down and, and had a discussion, they did not recommend starting these medications to treat NAFLD. The ASLD also does comment on children in their, in their current guidance. So similarly, they do not recommend metformin. They said you may consider vitamin E, but again, if you ask most pediatric gastroenterologists, we do not treat with vitamin E. What about other supplements? Ursodeoxycholic acid, or ursodiol, not recommended at this time. What about omega-3 fatty acids? So there was, several, like three years ago, there were so many articles coming out about fish intake and fatty liver, and could omega-3 be protective for fatty liver? And a lot of the studies weren't done very well, so the, the results, there weren't really good data. Because of the lack of data, and because of the data failing to show improvement in the fatty liver, it's not currently recommended by the AASLD for the treatment of NASH or NAFL. What about medicines like pioglitazone? And so these really work through glucose and lipid metabolism. In a patient with NASH, biopsy-proven NASH, there is a recommendation that you could use this in this population, and it does improve liver histology. But you have to know the risks and benefits before you start this medicine, specifically weight regain, bladder cancer, and bone loss in women. So these are not benign medications. And it should not be used to treat NAFLD without biopsy-proven NASH. So it's an option, but maybe something in the horizon that might have a little bit more potential, which is the GLP-1 agonists. 
a new class of medications that are out there. And right now, um, the ASLD does not have a specific recommendation for treatment of fatty liver with these agents. But from the studies that are coming out, they did show resolution of steatohepatitis, less progression to fibrosis, and greater weight loss. And you'll see in my upcoming slides, GLP-1 agonists are being used for weight loss in general. So what if diet and lifestyle fail? At that point, they should be, uh, that patient should be referred to a multidisciplinary clinic with an obesity medicine specialist, board certified specialist, or bariatric center. These are the groups that do um, not only weight loss surgery, but they have medicines for medical weight loss. And the, although these medicines are not you know, if you open up a textbook and you try to look for weight loss medicines, they're not listed as a treatment for NAFL. But remember, when that patient loses weight, their fatty liver will improve. So briefly, I've, I've left, I've, I've uh, provided you with the different categories of weight loss medicines. And I didn't go into great detail about this, but I wanted you to know what they are and, and that they exist. So there are medicines that are sympathomimetic amines, as you can see here. There are uh, gastrointestinal lipase inhibitors that have been on the market for, for several, several years. There's serotonin um, 5-HT2C receptor agonists. There are opioid antagonist uh, antidepressants really working on um, the cravings of those patients. And of course, as I mentioned, the GLP-1 receptor agonists. What's key to know that all these medications, and specifically these three, go through the liver for metabolism. So you have to just keep an eye on uh, those patients and their liver enzymes if they are used. What about weight loss medicine in children? Well, absolutely. They're, they're being used more and more um, as we have more patients with resistant obesity. For many, many years, Orlistat or, um, has been used, um, and it's been FDA approved in children greater than 12 years of age. This one, um, you know, if you think about it, it's, it's a lipase inhibitor, so the side effects are uh, significant fatty diarrhea, which limits its use. Metformin can be used in children with type 2 diabetes greater than 10 years of age and can produce a little bit of weight loss. Topiramate, not FDA approved, used off-label by many um, obesity centers, and it's used to control cravings. Sometimes used in conjugation with fentermine, um, now FDA approved for weight loss for kids that are 16 years of age. Now with these medications, I wouldn't recommend you know, a pediatrician to just start out prescribing these medicines. They should probably, those kids, should be sent to an obesity medicine specialist or to an obesity center because they do have side effects. And specifically, you know, fentermine, we remember its, its original starting point with fenfen and all the cardiac and sometimes neurological side effects. Uh, for those physicians who do treat patients with, uh, with agents like fentermine, they have to know their state and local laws. In Florida, so I'm not sure everyone's from Florida, but for in Florida, you do need a written consent form and you need very good documentation before you start this or else you might you know, open yourself to um, you know, legal um, action. So you have to really know uh, and really be um, trained to use these medications. So today we reviewed the definition, the etiology, the diagnosis, the comorbidities of fatty liver, and specifically fatty liver in obesity and metabolic syndrome. The things I want you to take away today, I had a lot of different things, a lot of slides, but these are the big topics. It's a histologic diagnosis. In children, you can start screening at nine to 11 years of age with that increased BMI. And in adults, Systematic screening is not recommended. Many, there are many ways to diagnose it, but do not use an uh, abdominal ultrasound. The, there are not really a lot of medications for NAFLD. There are some medications for NASH. And um, there are, of course, medicines that are used for weight loss that we went over briefly. And you know, the foundation and the treatment of fatty liver and obesity is still 
diet, exercise, and psychology. And I really want you guys to, um, you know, think about this because, you know, the, with the cost of health care, think about how the rates of obesity are going up. I'm starting to see patients, and I have to say, I see, you know, almost 80% of my population now is children with elevated liver enzymes and dyslipidemia. And I'm thinking long term, all of these children are going to be adults, and just think about the impact on the healthcare system. So it's important for all of us to, to really try our best to uh, be educated and then at least know your local resources. And if you're excited about it, you know, not only, you know, there are so many different avenues to contribute and maybe look into the OMA, which is the Obesity Medical Association, a multidisciplinary um, association trying to fight obesity. Thank you very much. Go, Jennifer. I'm good. <laughs> That's okay. I'm just going to go, Paula. Would, would, would you? Women's <laughs> 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 not on, Paula. One second. Is that, that one on? Try it again, Paula. Okay. Well, I've been over a lot of interesting topics. Here. Uh, Dr. Carter, I was wondering if there are any um, maybe outreach programs with the hospital or with the university. I don't know. I can talk loud enough for this room. <laughs> um, it, that would help children uh, find activities or have an activity oh, plan uh, where they could, you know, they're only going to see you at most once a month. You're right. But what's going to help them keep motivated? So first, so yes, the answer is yes, there are programs. As you know, here at All Children's, we, and you have to look at every institution has, you know, I think it's become popular, a lot of, um, you know, groups and hospitals want to build obesity centers and multidisciplinary centers. There's one at USF through, and then there's adolescent doctors. There are a great bariatric surgery group that, that they don't, they actually try not to do, this is what's amazing, they try not to do the surgery. So they have a year's worth of diet and social work and so these are the adult patients. So we have uh, options up in Tampa. But here in St. Petersburg we have Dr. Raquel Hernandez who does have a multidisciplinary um, obesity clinic where she does prescribe, just, just like me, I prescribe these medications as well. And there's Fit for All Kids, which is essentially nutrition and exercise um, you know, education for parents and kids. They come in, there's cooking classes. It's almost like a camp. There's cooking classes, the parents are there, the kids are in a big session, they learn about healthy nutrition, and then afterwards they get a two-month YMCA membership for free for the whole family. The trouble is, my patients who've done this, when they come back for fall, they're like, so did you register for the YMCA? They've lost weight, right? They, no, we, it was too expensive. I'm like, oh. Yeah. So, that's, so the thing is, there are programs out there, and you don't need to, you know, I found that, that you can still have success in a patient that doesn't have a lot of financial means. And I'll, I'll share with you one of my success stories. One of them, so I have a parents that are divorced, at which you think to yourself, oh my goodness, how are we going to get both parents on the same page? And it's just, you, you, have to, you have to take time and not be afraid. And you get both parents in the room with the child. And you just say to them, and they're arguing. And I say to them, I stop the argument. I say, you know, I'm not here to pick sides, but our goal, let's, let's make a goal that we're going to be, try, we're going to help this child's health. So dad says, OK, I will do my own thing. And mom says, I'll do my own thing. So this child, dad gets him into Taekwondo and follows the low glycemic diet to the T. The mom does a low glycemic diet in her own way, and she uh, gets him a little Fitbit and gives him a rule. You have to do 5,000 steps before you watch half an hour of TV. So here he is getting a structured exercise program on the weeks he's with dad, and then you have a structured program at home where he just, mom says he just runs around the house, goes up the stairs and down the stairs and up the stairs, shows the, the watch, says, okay, we can watch half an hour, and she's turns off the TV. He has to go back again. And he does the same thing over. And you have to see how much weight this child lost. And all their lipid panels got better, and the liver enzymes got better. And it's funny, when they loosened up a little bit, because weight regain is common, 
and he comes to a fault visit, and I think it was like two pound weight gain. And he's like, the dad was like, two pound weight gain? We got it covered. We're gonna, we're gonna take care of it. And we were like, oh, well, you, you know, it's okay. Two pounds is not that bad. He's like, no, no, we're gonna get him back. So there are, you'll be surprised. When the, when the goal is the child's health and that they love their child, you'd be surprised what they do. So. Thank you for sharing these experiences and this really excellent overview. Uh, we often see these patients in the Pete Endo Clinic before they get to the uh, liver disorders, <laughs> we hope, yeah. and are doing our best to try to keep them away from it. I have a used fentramine on a small number, and I like just having to see them every 30 days. This would be a one month. I can only give them a 30-day prescription. Right. And I have to get their weight and a review by a health care provider out there somewhere. As you know, we're kind of a center for telemedicine right now, and I just wonder how we can use something like maybe telehealth or telemedicine to get into these homes and get a day-to-day -day review of what they're up to. Well, I think that is a, a, a definite blooming area of medicine. Um, not used by our practice or our, our institution at this time. I know, you know some of the local hospitals here are using that. But I think that's a great modality because remember, the more you can keep a patient accountable, um, and telehealth could be one of those check-ins once a week so they don't have to drive. I think it's a great uh, modality to try to increase compliance and, and remind them. You know, and, and this is not a, a, a new concept. I mean, you see this in other uh, organized weight loss programs and commercial weight loss programs is that most of the time you have to check in every week and you have a weight check and you have a coach and you really need all three arms of diet, exercise, and everyone forgets that middle part, which is, I call it the mental health coach, because it's the choices that person's making that needs to be uh, addressed, and that telemedicine would be a great one, um, would be a great avenue. No. Have you seen the video that was done uh, with by Shaquille O'Neal? When he was playing basketball in Miami, he went to a middle school, and there were all these huge kids and they were just sitting around doing nothing, and he sort of had a meltdown. And he talked to the school persons and sent his personal diet coach over there. And what they did was they started an after-school program for exercise with the kids that were having the problems. And <clears throat> he also went and coached the, the, what they were having instead of cheeseburgers. They had like stir-fried vegetables, something that the kid would eat, yeah. not something that the kid wouldn't eat. And he, he, uh, he showed uh, with CT scanning the fat apron disappearing, the weight going down, the energy of the kids going up, the academic improvement going up, mm -hmm. this chronic mm -hmm. inflammation going on that's just destroying them at a young age. And, you know, the medical society could have done, we could have gone down and yelled at them and informed them and informed them like you're trying to do. But one athlete who got everybody exercising pretty soon, the whole school was exercising. Yeah. And then the moms and pops who looked like the fat kids came and started doing the same thing. It was yeah. really an interesting video. And I don't know where you get it, but I know that Charlie Crist was the governor at the time. And, he took a look at this stuff, and they had taken they had taken uh, recess out of the school system. Yeah. And, and they went, no, wait a minute, you know, you yeah. gotta let these guys go out and burn calories. But it was a great video because he he followed these kids and put his own money into the study, showing, you know, I mean, the, the CTs of the admin, the fat inhibitors, the the uh, fat apron, all re receding and and academic improvement going on. So Absolutely. it was really a, a, an impact where a major sports guy could do something. And I wonder if uh, we could get some of our athletes to help these kids because actually they're the role models. Right. And we're telling them things they don't want to hear and, and these guys are showing them ways that they might begin to participate, I guess. But it's a great, it's a great video showing Shaquille mm -hmm. O'Neal and this weight problem that was about five or six years ago, or whenever Charlie Chris was governor. Exactly, exactly. And I actually want to mention, um, also in to supplement what you're saying, in the medical literature, Dr. Ludwig is up in San Francisco. He's a pediatrician that works 
on metabolic syndrome and, and um, you know, fatty liver and obesity. And there was a study that came out, and the headline was, um, even one week of diet and exercise improves metabolic markers in children. So even within a week, there is an improvement, much less the CT changes that you're mentioning. Um, Second thing is about the school systems. Absolutely. I mean, the moment that I have my patients packing lunches, I mean, that's, that's a huge, the quality uh, of what we, sh what we sh want is not very good. And when you have a patient that doesn't have lunch or has financial issues, what's the baseline lunch? Peanut butter and jelly, right? So fat and sugar. Uh, so it's, it's definitely something where, um, you know, we can make an impact as, as providers and to educate our, our school systems and, and try to make an impact because it makes a difference in the long run for our next generation.